Hey, everybody. Welcome to Big Blend Radio. Today, we are talking with Texas blues guitarist Lance Lopez about his brand new album, Trouble is Good. And I'm telling you, I always rate music about is it road trip worthy and is it speed ticket worthy? Um, you know, Elaine from Seinfeld always, are you sponge worthy? Well, anyway, I'm into speed speeding tickets. I don't want one, but this is worth it. This is a badass album. You've got to get it now. You can go to his website, LanceLopez.net. It is out through Cleopatra Records, and they're awesome. You can get an actual vinyl copy and also get it digitally and all that good stuff. Download it, stream it, um, but get something that I'd say the vinyl is cool. So welcome to the show, Lance. How are you? I'm great. Thank you so much for having me on. And thank you so much for all those kind things you said about the album. Thank you so much. Hey, I'm serious. Like, I know I'm going to get in trouble with this. And that's okay. <laughs> it's okay. You know, that's as right. I said, trouble I, is good, right? <laughs> yeah, trouble is good. Exactly. Exactly. I love it. I love it. It's a good. And listen, the title track is awesome, too. I think that gives people a really good introduction you. to your sound. It brings in a little bit of everything from the album, you know, um, yeah, you have you. you have so much going on in and it and it rocks from start to finish. That's the other thing, a good flow. But um you. you you know, when you go from I know this latest two singles was Jam With Me and Uncivil War, but then you oh. go and close the album with Voyager. Man, now we're getting trippy. Right. It's good stuff. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. But thank you. Yeah, we, we wanted to we wanted to cover the landscape and you know, uh, b- being categorized as a, as a blues rock artist, um, and, 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 you know, or Texas, you know, it's a lot of times Texas blues, but, you know, generally it's blues rock. So we definitely wanted this record to rock. I mean, you know, if it's blues rock, we wanted to really feature that influence in that side of the record, really kind of going th- through the pandemic because we didn't really know what was going to happen. So it was like, well, let's just make a record that we want to make and, and let's pull out the styles and the influences that we want to, we want to showcase and deliver with these songs. And so, uh, yeah, a lot of it's an era piece. A lot of it has to do with the, with the, with the, uh, the pandemic and the lockdown era. And it's an era piece of that whole time period. And then, like you say, then we, we, uh, we kind of end it with some, uh, you know, with some kind of tripped out spiritual progressive type music that I was working on when I first arrived here in Nashville. So it was really so great to see how, um, you know, a song like Voyager that was one of the first songs I wrote when I landed here in Nashville to come to fruition that way with just an acoustic guitar that John Hyatt gave me and sitting on a bed with an open, tu- sitting on the bed with an open tuning and then to visualize it finished now on the record is, is just, that's the gratification of, of writing songs. So I'm just so happy that, uh, that you enjoy it and, and saying all those great things about it. Thank you so much. Yeah. It's a levitation song, you know? It's- <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. No, I, I dig it. I, you know, it, that's what I say. It's got a little bit of everything. It's kind of like, you know, you go into a restaurant and you get your appetizer and then you're like, man, this is the meal. And then, you know, this is, this is the, you know, but you get to have more mm-hmm. than three courses here, which is good. It, it is like a sampler, but then you get to like wild country or something. I think, I think people will really, it kind of like brings, brings everybody home. Right. <laughs> you know what I mean? Absolute, it's, it's, a- absolutely. Yeah. Wild country. And, and, you know, wild country was probably one of the first tracks we started working on on the album. I mean, that was, that was a song that we had been working on that was kind of left from the tell the truth era that Joey Sykes and I had been writing because uh, Joey produced the record and Joey had been writing for my last album, as well as a band I was in called supersonic blues machine. So we had a relationship uh, extending that far back. And so we had a, we had a, a stable of songs that we were drawing from that were left over that we thought, you know, and, and a lot of them didn't make the record, but we recorded them. You know, we, we had a lot of songs that were, that were left over and uh, so we just began working on those songs. And so Wild Country was one that was so amazing because I was able to bring together, like we did on most of these tracks on the record, but to begin working on that song, we brought together uh, the great Brian Titchy, um, drummer that was with uh, White Snake and Ozzy and, and, and now the Dead mm-hmm. Daisies. And then uh, Jurgen Carlson uh, from Government Mule, bass player, uh, and Buck Johnson, who plays keyboards with Aerosmith and the Hollywood Vampires. So I was able to really pull this this incredible, and, and as well as Joey Sykes playing rhythm guitar. 
So to pull this incredible band together and Jurgen even was, was like, you know, he since has left government mule recently and he was saying, he was just like, man, this needs to be a band. <laughs> like This needs to be totally, like, you know, and we, and, and so that happened. That's what was beautiful about each track with the collective of musicians that we put together. It was like, each track was just like, wow, this could be, this is, it was like just playing with another great band and another great band and another great band. So as opposed to, like a supersonic blues machine, I was just in one band and it was one collective of musicians. This was like doing it over and over each song, you know, with each, mm-hmm. with, with, with iconic musicians that showed up to play that I was so very honored and so very grateful for. Like jam with me with Greg Bissonette, who's out with Ring, currently out with Ringo Starr right now. Oh, yeah. Um, you know, um, like I said, Brian Titchy, and then we had Bobby Rondinelli from Rainbow and Black Sabbath playing drums, Danny Miranda from Blue Oyster Cult. Um, you know, John Hummel would work with Lady Gaga. I mean, just on and on and on, just, just great, great, iconic musicians that showed up on each track. And I just was so grateful for that. So Wild Country was one of those and it was one of the first. And I was just so grateful for the collective musicians that showed up to, to make this record with me. Yeah. I think that should be like an anthemic kind of Fourth of July song, Labor Day weekend, Memorial Day, Veterans Day kind of. You know, it, it's got that feel to it, yet um, very personal, too, it, depending on who you are as you listen. You know what I mean? That's what I, you know, I, I have my opinions of what makes me feel good, but everybody listens to music in their own way, even regardless what you write. You know what I mean? It's like, hey, they take it personally, which I think is a beautiful thing. It's a co-creative experience, and definitely this album has that. And I, what I find ener- en- interesting is the energy on it. I know it's a right. studio-produced album, but it doesn't it feels like you're at a show and i i think that heightened energy of having different people you know jam with you, <laughs> you know? Right. the jam with me is in there it's got that vibe which throughout the album which yet yet not like jam like sloppy jam you know what i mean it, it you guys know right. what you're doing obviously but it right, has that right. energy right well i think a lot of that was um you know the, the again the, the collective of, of just legendary icons that showed up to play, um, you know, that, that, that either flew tracks in. Now, when we, when, when the, 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 the beginning of the album started at home and that was, that was kind of the essence of trouble is good. I mean, that's when the pandemic started and COVID hit and all those things happened, we had already been in talks about making a record. We had offers coming in from Europe to go back over and play some festivals and I had, I had, you know, taken a big extended break and I was, I started playing out live again. I'd gone over to Little Rock and done a thing for the Arkansas River Blues Society. Sweet. Um, and so I was like, you know, we were, we were, we were gearing up for, every, you know, here, let's make another record. Let's go back on the road and then bang COVID. So what it did was I had talked for years about getting a home recording set up to fly tracks in at home and, you know, and produce, produ- especially when I was on supersonic blues machine, everybody was just hounding me to get my home recording thing happening because I had a big place with the guitars and amps to work on all that stuff, but not recording. And I was too busy on the road all the time. I was, I was focused more on live gigs and playing shows and working and, um, and not really recording at home. And um, so when COVID happened and we were already in, in talks of making a record, it then, you know, shifted me into a new computer and interface the all the software, the DAWs, the, the whole thing mm. going down the rabbit hole of microphones. And the thing that was really cool was I was living in houses. The first house I lived in when we started the record, we, we dubbed it the jam house, had the big vaulted ceilings and big wide spaces so we were able to do the old school tricks of hanging the microphones off the, the stairwells and all the things that all the great bands that we loved and grew up with did in houses and how they recorded. So it, 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 it that's what kind of got us through everything. It just refocused and we went into home recording and, um, but we were, we were exchanging ideas between Nashville and LA with Joey. And then Joey was tracking, um, you know, the bands in LA. So he would, he would mm. track certain tracks, you know, I, we would, we would flesh the ideas out and then he would get a basic track and then email all that back to me. And then I would play lead or whatever guitar parts and then cut my vocals, you know, in my bedroom, you know, or in my wow. living room or in my dining room, you know, I mean, and what was so funny, like trying on the tri trying in the tri-star state guitar sounds were two Marshall stacks and a microphone 20 okay. feet away in my kitchen. 
you know. No way. And, <laughs> Rattle those know, pots and pans. <laughs> Yeah, and then I go into a big studio and it was like with tons of amps and it got smaller. And I went, how is this possible? I just cut this guitar track in my kitchen. And then I came over here and it got weird. So when we, when, when everything began to open, we went to, uh, we went to New York first, Joey and I went to New York. So the organic sound came from us going, you know, to work with Danny Miranda and Bobby Rondinelli and, and, um, you know, these icons we wanted to go work with to get these sounds like on the title track and, and on Civil War and these other other same things that they played on Voyager. And, you know, and so we all were in a room together. You know, we were all looking at each other. We were all vibing together. So that was part of uh, part of it. You know, we were able to, to track live some of this stuff in studios, especially when everything opened up. So that definitely added to the organic feel that you're talking about. And then this music is that anyway. So we, we wanted to really accentuate that. It, you know, to me, it's super just cool to hear the different processes because as a listener, you, you know, we don't know everything that goes into it. You know, you're just right. like, man, this is some badass music. Like this is, <laughs> this is tasty goodness. You know, Thank it's you. like when you find really good barbecue, I know you know about that. It's like, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to sink my teeth in this. And it's, mm. you know, I know that everyone, you know, raves about your guitar playing, Jeff Beck, and, you know, they're all, all for all good reasons, right? But I was listening to your voice and I was like, holy cow, like, how are you doing that? I mean, it's like, your, your voice is insanely good. I mean, it's strong, oh, it's powerful, it's dynamics. I mean, so like, I mean, that's what I think people should be like raving about that as much as they do your guitar work because they're both, um, incredible. And I do agree with you about blues rock. In fact, um, I, I have to give a shout out to our friends who are sponsoring the show because they're huge rock, you know, metal heads music. They, they are all in it. And, um, they're like, I don't care, whatever you've got to put us on all these kinds of shows. And they run a bed and breakfast, the lion and the rose in Asheville, North Carolina. Uh-huh. Um, you know, we call them Mr. and Mrs. Wild. And uh-huh. they, if they're not out looking for wildlife in the Blue Ridge Mountains, or Smoky Mountains, they're out following bands across the country, and they do run a bed and breakfast in the meantime. Wow. <laughs> so everyone, lion-rose.com, but I was thinking of them when incredible. I was listening, and I'm like, yeah, this is blues, but there's like wow. this huge dose of rock, but you've warmed the edges right. of it, yet yeah. hard. you've got some hardcore in there, but your voice is carrying it like, like seriously. Wow. Your voice well, is incredible. You. Yeah, tell us about well, the development you. of that and your and your guitar. Like, which came first, the thank chicken you. or well, the egg? Well, thank <laughs> you. Well, thank you so much, Lisa, for all those kind words. And, and I want to definitely go check out that bed and breakfast because I love Asheville. It's <laughs> that awesome. Sounds, that sounds pretty groovy. Um, hey, they give they, you check in with a beer. They make beer there. So, um, <laughs> right on. <laughs> well, hey, uh, I you know I just. As a kid, I got to play with a lot of iconic soul singers and blues singers and R&B singers. And, uh, you know, and I was really guided very, very early because, you know, in those bands, you had to be able to sing and be a background singer and sing harmonies. And, you know, in some of those in some of those groups that we, you know, when I was when I was a sideman as a kid. And that's how it truly began. You know, I didn't really understand that the voice was another instrument. You know, I didn't mm-hmm. really understand that it didn't really land for me until I sat down with a, with a great singer that, uh, you know, showed me, you know, um, the great, um, you know, black Southern gospel music. And, and the root of where it came from and some of the older blues singers and some of the, the roots of where great icons learned from. And that's what I was really privileged to the knowledge to really receive was, you know, where, what, what, what well are you drinking from? You know, where are you learning what you're doing and, and how do you begin to start? And so that is where I began, you know, at 17 years old as a vocalist. And then it was just, you know, the influence of great singers like Stevie Wonder and Donnie Hathaway and, and, and all these great R and B singers and then all the great blues singers like BB King, Bobby Blue Bland who I was able to be around and like I said, gain this knowledge from. So yeah. it was, uh, you know, that was, that was the, the, the key for me then to expand on my own and begin to delve in and, and seek out and search. And then it was just like the guitar playing. It was sitting down and trying to mimic great singers, you know, while adding my own inflections and then years of being on the road and, and, you know, singing through, 
subpar PAs and having to sing louder oh, than God. The <laughs> were loud. And that kind of added a lot of, a lot of gravel and then, you know, cigarettes, whiskey and everything else, <laughs> you know, <laughs> added the, added the, the extra added flair, flair and flavor <laughs> so, yeah. of years of that. So, you know, yeah, no, no. It, and, but there's a level of, you know, both guitar and with the singing of yeah. it's just like a commit, like a commitment to it. Like when what? you're performing it, you have to go, you can't half-ass it. Like you're playing and you're singing, there's no half-assing. It is, you have to commit. Just like a comedian, even if they're bombing, they have to commit. Otherwise, right. it really bombs, right? So right. that level of just kicking it in and going just, you know, full tilt boogie, <laughs> you know, right. is huge to do. Right. And, right. and then tour that way too. I mean, do you have to like take care of your voice? I mean, I, I come on the whiskey eventually has to run dry on, on voices and no, vocal absolutely. cords, right? And that's been, it's been quite some time since that's happened. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah, it was just like I said, it was, it was years of that back, you know, as, 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 you know, um, as a young man on the road, you know, living life and having fun. And so, you know, I, uh, yeah, nowadays it's, it, you know, as I have gotten older, absolutely. Um, you know, and so it's, it's a fact of, of definitely taking care of my voice, um, you know, and, and knowing my monitoring situation on stage, like it, it's got to be the loudest thing on stage, you know, period, or I will hurt myself and not be able to, to perform the next yeah. few, like if I'm on tour. So it's very crucial that the monitoring, you know, I've used in-ear monitors, I've used floor wedges for speakers, you know, and stuff, but it's one of the most crucial things that I be able to hear my voice. And, and so, um, you know, we just kind of really pay a lot of attention to that, you know, uh, that, you know, that sonically that we're okay live. And then, yeah, it's just about taking care of yourself on the road, you know, and learning how to take care of yourself, knowing what you can and can't do and, all those different things, like, you know, um, and it's just, and it just boils down to self care, basically. Yeah. I mean, you know, yeah. just knowing what, when you're on the road, you're traveling and you're doing hardcore touring and you're, you know, and it's, and it's very aggressive and intense. It's going to then require an extra level of self care. Yeah. It's really true. I mean, you hear that, you know, musicians everywhere now, it's like, okay, I can't do what I thought I could do like years ago It's you know, in your twenties and in even thirties, you know, it gets, mm -hmm. there comes to this level of being able to put out a good show, you know? And I think, um, especially after the pandemic, you know, audiences are right. so like stoked to be able to go out and see live concerts again, even right. just like, we want to go see a bar band, please. I mean, anything <laughs> out there and we want to see live music. There's nothing, there's nothing like it on the planet. So it's exciting that you're touring with the album. Um, and so I want people to know again, if you go to, uh, his website, Lance's website, lancelopez.net, uh, you'll see all, you know, obviously get the album. And I want to talk about the vinyl and everything too, but you're on tour through Indiana, Florida, Texas, uh, Louisiana. Oh, I love Louisiana, Mississippi, Jackson. Oh, cool. And, and Indianapolis again. Man, you keep circling around Indiana. What's up with Indiana? <laughs> you got to think for that. <laughs> it's just north of Tennessee. We can run up there real quick and come home. <laughs> yeah, that's true. I just did it's it. Not yeah. Very far from Nashville. So we like to, we like, we got a lot of friends up there. So we like to go up there and play for our friends. And then, you know, usually we can turn around and drive back, you know, mm. if, if it's warranted, not always, we like to stay up there, but yeah, Indiana's not far away in the Midwest. And, and we have lots of friends and, and fans in the Midwest that we like to go play for. So Sweet. that these are just the beginning of the tour and we, you know, at the end of the year dates are coming in steadily. And so by the end of the year and the first part of next year, we're covering this region and we're, we're trying to make some plans to go over after the first of the year, uh, spring and summer to Europe. So we're working on we're working on various things for touring behind trouble is good, but yeah, for now we're kind of going back to our our fan our hardcore fan base uh, in our regions where we've where we've always been loved and 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 love our people, and uh, and we're going to to take the record to them and 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 play that live before branching out for the rest of the world. So that's okay. that's kind of the the uh, the idea of the tour, and uh, and then we look forward to seeing everybody else in 2024 and towards the end of this year. We're going to be definitely expanding the, the, the tour dates and getting out. There's, there's a lot of stuff in the work. So dates are coming in every day. So it's best to check 
our website at lancelopez.net and we've got a little bands in town calendar and dates are coming in every day. So that's great. I hope to see you guys like, you know, perform. I I want to, that energy is just like, yeah, I know it's just, it, going to get in trouble, like whether it's speeding or something, something's going to happen. I just know it. It's, it's one of those. Yeah. I can tell it's one of those experiences that, um, yep. Uh-huh. I won't be going to bed that night. You know what I mean? It's like, how can you, right. how do you go to bed after a concert like that kind of feeling? You can't, right. you have, how do you wind down? You know? Oh, I know. No, <laughs> but, uh, right. now going, going to, um, Texas, Louisiana. Didn't you go back and forth between Texas and Louisiana quite a bit in in your younger years? Uh, I did, and that's one that's one of the reasons why. Like I said again, but you know, it's kind of our regional home, and so it's 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 kind of a good warm up and a good restarting point to go back out to you know our familiar places. You know, um, I did. I uh, in 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 high school, I um, I moved. Uh, originally when I was 12, I moved, my, my father moved to New Orleans and my mother moved to Dallas. And I went with my okay. mom to that. Da- I went with my mom to Dallas and lived for a couple of years and discovered the blues and was around I- and saw iconic blues performers and snuck in all the blues clubs as a 13 year old boy. And, you know, God bless Doug Henry at Blue Cat Blues and David Card at Poor David's Pub in Dallas, Texas, because they would let me and my little friend Chad, who sadly passed away, about a year and a half ago, he was my little running buddy. We um, we would sneak into, into into poor David's pub when Albert Collins would be playing, or oh out wow, or, or any and he and so back in those days there were payphones. So what those club owners used to do <laughs> was make us go stand by the pay. We couldn't move. We had to stand by the payphone because that their logic was if somebody came in and there were kids in there, they would go, oh, they, we just let them in to use the phone. Yeah, you know. So we would we would stand by the payphone and and got to see Doyle Bramhall and Albert Collins and and, wow. and Bugs Henderson and Anson Funderburg and Jimmy Vaughn and all these you know iconic people and stood you know five feet away from them and got to and, and got a great education early on and then I moved and then just diligently working and just ingesting and devouring everything that had to do with the blues. I then moved to New Orleans with my dad and he had seen how advanced I had got on guitar and how much I was just deep diving into the blues. And he immediately was like, we live in New Orleans. You're going out to play live, you know? And that was like, it's like, he was like, it's time. And he drug me out to various clubs in the French quarter. And then at the time we lived in, we lived in a a Metairie, which is a suburb of New Orleans and Jefferson Mm -hmm. parish. And, um, and in Metairie, there was a small area called Fat City. And Fat City was like a mini French Quarter for the locals there. It was like a locals thing because, you know, the French Quarter was really touristy and mm-hmm. that whole kind of vibe. Fat City was like a local French Quarter and like, and we lived in it. We, our apartment was like in it. So it was like living in a mini French Quarter. And so I literally could walk out my, fr- out, out of our apartment and walk three doors down to the gig. I mean, I literally was in my neighborhood. Yeah, that's sweet. Playing, That's playing, you know, clubs and down, you know, two doors down. So, um, and that's how we did it. And so early on, that's what happened. My dad, had been, he took me out and I met guys and I sat in and they began to hire me. And then he was kind of like, you're on your own. And so I was like 14, 15 years old. And I would, I would, I would get out of school at like three 30 and my first gig would be at five. And I, we would play a happy hour gig from like five to eight. And then we would leave that gig like in the French Quarter or Fat City. And then we would go to uh, uh, a, a, you know, nine to 12 gig in the French Quarter, like 7 Eleven or late night bourbon or one of those. And then, and then we would go back to Fat City for the after hours gig from five or I'm sorry, from like two to five. And then I would get off the gig at 5 30, get my guitar and amp. I would, I would scurry back home and lay down for two hours to be back at school at 8 30. Man, but you know, but listen, that's like real education, right? There's nothing like a a rehearsal (laughs) is live. A a live show gets you faster than noodling in your room. You know what I mean? It it just puts you, pushes you way ahead fast. And, and then you went to school. I mean, and how much did you want to stay in school? (laughs) Yeah, I mean, I knew what I wanted to do at that point. And so did the teachers, you know, they knew I was working and they just, they kind of left me alone for a while. I mean, I just, 
kind of, you know, I was very much a lone wolf. I, I had, I had some friends, but like I was out playing in clubs with, you know, grown ups and, you know, hanging in the music scene. So I was like, just kind of like that, that was it. And I was making money, you know, and that was, that was the thing that, um, I, that was my job. That was my, like everybody has a, has a, has a, a job in high school, you know, like working at McDonald's or Burger King or washing cars or cutting grass mm-hmm. or, you know, delivering newspapers. I was, I was out playing gigs. And one of the things I remember is that like, I mean, most teenagers that, that have a, have a, have a, a day job, you know, after school is, you know, on the weekends, all my friends would be, you know, having parties and you know how kids do, they go out in the woods and they get a keg of beer or they get whatever. <laughs> and they were having these big, high, and I was playing in, you know, blues clubs. And I was like, man, my friends are all partying and, and I'm working. And so that was one of the things that early on I, I, I began to experience was that, you know, um, were those things as a kid, you know, that, that, that was the other side of it was that I was still a kid, you know, I was still, I still had all the emotions of a kid, even though I was playing with men that were in their fifties, you know, or forties and like my yeah. you know older guys, you know, it was like, I was still a kid and my friends were still partying and hanging out and I was playing and working and not able to hang out. So I think that was my experience. Whereas, you know, sitting in a video store, Remember, we had video stores back then. <laughs> Block, remember yeah. Blockbuster? Rewind. Remember Blockbuster? Don't... <laughs> yeah. Like, you know, you're working at Blockbuster and all your friends are at the party. It's the same thing. So that was, that was kind of my deal was like, I was, I was playing gigs and, um, but I was, I was, I was earning money and that was my job. And that's kind of how my father looked at it. I mean, that was my job. So. Yeah. Um, you know, but there's something real. I mean, you have those moments. I mean, I kind of had a childhood, you know, um, traveling a lot as you still now, but uh-huh. also as soon as I could work, work. And right. I, I did have my moments of, of shenanigans, uh-huh. but it was uh-huh. different. And I mean, I, I got out of high school and I think I was barely 17 and I, I was out, man. I'm like, I'm out. Right. I graduated right. and everything, but you know, I was, all, I was so driven to work and, and some of my best friends are the same way. We're like, we want the hell out of here. I went to like 16 schools, insane in different countries. And, by the time, you know, graduation time came or matric, as they said in South Africa, we actually sat in our exams to my one friend and I raced each other to finish the exams. Like how, that's how bad we were about wanting out. And then when it came to get our results, we we're like, uh oh, what the heck did we do? But it was we were all into there's one side everyone was getting married and pregnant. And then the other side of us were like, we want out to work. And, and I was right. always working and doing stuff and, um, you know, sell my mom's art and stuff. You know, I was always like, mm-hmm. since I was God, you know, right. as soon as you could work, you do it. And, yeah. and there were those times where I just, you know, you can't do this. You have to do that. And I was like, damn it. Right. And then I remember right. once when I first got to this country, um, my friends mm-hmm. and my family had tickets to see the Rolling Stones. They had a limo take them there. Wow, and I, wow. my first job in this country was working in a deli mm-hmm. after working in a magazine, mm-hmm. right? Right. Because we just got back to this country. Right. And I had a shift and I didn't want to screw uh-huh. up the job because we were like starting over, just got back to this country and I was right, young, right. but I missed that over a yeah. gig at a, like a deli. Are you frigging kidding me? I could have right. seen stones been taken. The, I mean, it was like this huge show and I, I think there was, I don't want, there was a, it was like a double booking too. I was like, right. damn it. That was stupid. Out of, right. but I've got good worth it, work ethics now. You know That's what I mean? Awesome. So I know. One, well, one of my, one of mine was like, you know, that we had a place called the Greenville Bar and Grill in Dallas. That was the iconic place. It's where I met Billy Gibbons in, in the early nineties mm. and everybody else. And I had to play two nights in a row there when the first page and plant tour came around with the big orchestra oh, and, and the mid nineties. And I was a kid, I was playing blues, you know, this is a very iconic place. And so the first page and plant, my girlfriend and all my friends and everybody I knew were all going, nobody was coming to my gig. <laughs> you know, yeah. They're all going to page and plant. And, and I was so bummed and I had to work and I walked in the Greenville bar and grill to load in and there was Robert Plant and his son sitting at the bar eating a burger. You know, and it was just so cool. And I was just like, man, I'm, I'm playing here, you know, so I got to walk <laughs> in and, and, and experience that. But yeah, it was, it was that thing. And still I got to, you know, hang out with them and see them and meet them. And then I hung out with Billy Gibbons that night after my gig at Cafe Brazil in Dallas and got the whole rundown and he had been hanging with Jimmy Page. And so 
I got the whole, the whole spiel of what was happening. However, you know, I got the firsthand accounts with the guy, but you know, it was like, it was, again, it was like that same thing, you know, even though I was doing what I love and I was playing a gig, everybody was going to see Jimmy Page and Robert Plant. And I was, and I got to see the next tour. I was front row on my, my 21st birthday. It was pretty amazing. Ah, uh, see, there you uh, go. So I got, it paid off, you know, I got the front row first, you know, next tour. And so it was amazing, but, but still it was, it was still that thing like we're talking about, you know, like you at the deli with the stones and me playing at the Green Bar Grill with, with, with Led Zeppelin. Yeah, but playing. Billy Gibbons didn't come and order pastrami on rye. <laughs> 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 that well, would have oddly been cool. Enough, oddly enough, you know, we had the, in Dallas Cafe Brazil's there and I walked in after my gig because that was like where everybody hung is a 24 hour place. And I walked in and there was Billy kind of had a long table and he was like, hello. And he motioned me over and I went over and sat with him. And so I didn't even know he was there. I walked in and there's Gibbons and, and they had just all come from the show. So, you know, it was just really cool times, man. Really, really cool times. Yeah. Those are formative years, you know, those beginning times and you, you know, you have to just like, damn it. You know, we have that now, you know, in, in life, you know, as adults too, but you know, it's, right. it just, it is those formative years. I do want to go back to, you know, the whole Texas, Louisiana thing. Cause I keep threatening of doing a show just on the South, like nice. doing Texas, Louisiana, just music, right? A music nice. show on it. Texas, Louisiana, Georgia, Florida, Alabama's got to be in there too, of course. And I know it can stretch out, got North Carolina South. I can't leave them all out, but there is something about this musical blend that brings in like the desert and the Norteno music and, like, I, you know, like Ry Cooter to me is just does amazing work of oh, bringing it up the roots, you know, yeah, uh, but <laughs> he's like, an, I, I, he's like on my top 10 of I like, can't even, I have no words for the greatness of Ry Cooter. <laughs> right. Yeah. You know, it's like, um, I keep going back. There's this, the YouTube series of him at the old gray whistle test. Is it uh, whistle, whistle test or stop? Oh, yeah. I, and, um, yeah. God, it, it just the, the yeah. showmanship and, and, just bringing in the diversity, the cultural diversity. When I was listening to your album, that's kind of where I was going. It's like, you've got a little bit of everything in there. And it, I think there's something about Texas and Louisiana, those two being together and Mississippi. God, I can't, Mississippi, God damn. I can't, I can't bring that. You can't leave that out either, you know? No. Um, of course not. It's just, there's something about this, you know, you can't say it's all, you know, blues it's it there's blues and there's a little country there's like juke joint blues versus you know i don't know there's just um and there's just blues out there that's that shouldn't be labeled as blues that's just so there's 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 a thing about a feeling like you've got feeling in there yet you know how to rock it and that's a balance Mm -hmm. too you know what i mean you can't fake it and there's right. something so real about these the music that comes from these states that you cannot fake it unless you're an idiot and and <laughs> and then you suck like you don't do it. <laughs> I'm trying really hard to watch my language, but oh, man. you know I what I mean. Too. Yeah, I do. I do. I do. I do know what you mean. I do know what you mean. Well, that's that's a great it's a great um uh great observation. And yeah, I, you know, being born in Louisiana and then being raised in Texas. Like it wasn't until I was 12 and moved to Texas that I, that I, I started to understand when I, when I started to, to, uh, devour literally everything that was related that was blues oriented, you know, um, I be, I played very already naturally bluesy. My dad started me on Chuck Berry. You know what I mean? Mm. I mean, that was where I started. Well, yeah. So I didn't even understand what it was. All I knew was that I needed to learn these licks because if I learned them, my dad was going to buy me an electric. So that was just, that was the, that was the incentive, incentive, you know, to learn that style and not knowing that it was blues and those were blues, blues based Mm -hmm. progressions. And so, you know, and then that's why I then gravitated to when me and my older brother and all our friends and cousins and everybody went to go see ACDC. We all, I stood there and I went, Oh my God, this makes total sense to me. Yeah. Not knowing that Angus Young's playing Chuck Berry, you know, right, and exactly. he's, you know, and I'm going, this is high power blues. And I didn't, under, I didn't know that. And so I would, I would jam with the kids and you got to think this is like the eighties with the stranger things kids era, <laughs> you know, and everybody's shredding and tapping and wanting to be a metal shredder. And I'm over there playing Mississippi Queen. You know, I was like, this is what I'm gravitating towards and Jimi Hendrix and, and all the, the yeah. old blue rock guys and not knowing. And so I would play with my friends and they would say, Oh man, this is bluesy. 
I told my dad, I, I came home and he, and, and he introduced me to BB King. And that was almost as profound as discovering Jimi Hendrix for me. Mm-hmm. And I was like, Oh my God, that's what I'm searching for. And then when I moved to Dallas, probably a year later with my mom, immediately getting there, I looked in the paper and there was a giant picture of BB King. And I went, mom, can we go see, you know, I'm 12 mom, take me to see BB King. And she was like, absolutely. And we went and I got to see BB and CB Ray Vaughn, you know, and oh, I, my, I, you got I, to see Stevie Ray Vaughn too. I like, had no, damn. I had no clue he even existed. Like I didn't even know. I, I went to see BB King. And when we got to the concert, literally everybody at the show had an SRV t-shirt on. And I was looking around the concert and I was going, what is SRV? Like, what does this mean? Like, I was annoyed. I was angry about it because I was like, why? <laughs> you know? And B.B. King came out. It was life changing. And then they came out and said, since it's his, ho- his hometown show, we're going to let Steve. Ray-. And I was like, who? And then all of a sudden, bang, you know, and it was just like the most blindsiding event of my life. Mm. And, uh, and, and Jimi Hendrix had been the bar for me. I mean, that was, there was like really Jimi Hendrix and everything else. And then I had never witnessed anybody try to attempt to play or perform any Jimi Hendrix music. I, I, to me, it was like, you just couldn't, to me, it was like, it's not even possible at that age, you know, as a kid, I was like, it's not even possible to recreate this music or try to even, att- I mean, I was learning it. But I was like, there's no way I could go out and play this ever live. You know, there's, it's just so, you know, and then to watch Steve Ray Vaughn play Voodoo Child's Slight Return, I was like, this can't even Dang. be real. You know, um, so it was really profound for me. So that led me. And then, you know, watching Jimmy, uh, uh, Stevie Ray Vaughn and BB King jam together was the first blues jam I ever witnessed, you know, so that was it for me where I just, I devoured everything blues. And that's when I began to understand that. I mean, I remember hanging out at Charlie's Guitar Shop, waiting for Stevie Ray Vaughan to come home with my Jimi Hendrix records under my arm with Mark Pollock and Smoking Joe Kubek and all those guys when I was 12. That were, we were waiting for Stevie to come back. And that's what they were telling. They were like, dude, you're from, you, you don't even understand where you're from, kid. You know what I mean? And that's where I started to understand, like, you know, cause I would just, then I would also talk about all the old blues guys, you know, that I was discovering like Sun House and Robert Johnson and Charlie Patton and Blind Willie McTell and Blind Willie Johnson and Big Joe Williams and all those guys that I was, uh, that I was devouring all the country blues. And I would talk about that and they would go, dude, you're just like a hundred miles away from where that was invented. <laughs> you know? See, that's, that's it. Like it's so now you, now I have to think that I have to add Missouri in there too. Cause there's stuff going on there. It's, yeah. it's, fascinating to me about how and you know you even think about how the blues went up to you know chicago you know got muddy waters and you've got you know buddy guy and everybody going up you know chicago way and so when you that's why i was interested about you going to indiana because stuff you know stuff changed you know music the the scene started to spread out and up north and in historically right so i don't know there's something just really about getting to the roots of it all in these areas and how things could cross over yet um, like diversification is celebrated. You know, we are the big blend, you know, here. So we like that stuff. You know, we, right. we like it to be like, if you're in nature, you want biodiversity. You don't just want one plant. You want to see all kinds of plants, you know? So maybe right. we're just piggish, you know, and greedy about this, but the same thing with music. If, when things can, when genres can cross and, and not be pigeonholed, I think that's when the beauty happens. That's what's beautiful about your album is that you went on, you did really take us on a journey of, of music and you've got the roots in there at the same time, rocking it in all kinds of ways. Um, I think it's, and, um, just in, in closing, I do want to touch on, uh, the, the one, so uncivil war. Right. Wow. I, that, yeah. like that can go personal and that can go with our, country right now or yeah you could do absolutely. europe and england i mean you know absolutely. Absolutely. you could do exactly. you got it you, you absolutely got it thank you for getting it <laughs> yeah like that that um Standing. that's that's a very people need to listen to that because maybe yeah. we'll kind of get re- it together re- somehow <laughs> yeah and that goes with the diversity too <laughs> right say. right that's you know? the pr- i mean that's the hope and the prayer i mean it it, it, it goes from you know, I had a marriage that ended and which led me to, to moving to Nashville. And, uh, you know, it was a healing piece for me, as well as, like you said, for, for sociopolitical reasons as well, with what happened during the pandemic, what was happening during 
you know, everything, you know, I, I literally unplugged. I, I've, I've, I've been, my life has been a lot better, um, you know, with, with a lot of things that were happening sociopolitically um, with the pandemic and everything else. I literally turned my TV off. I was watching mm-hmm. it every morning, watching the news, watching it and, and it just and, 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 and absorbing all of that energy that I had to shut it down. And I became more serene. I became more peaceful. Mm-hmm. I became more creative. And I was not, and I went, wow, you know, just absorbing that energy and how it was, what it was doing to me. And, uh, and even still today, like I, I, I just, I, you know, I, I choose to check in on the, on the media and the news every now and then. But like when it was like very, you know, hectic and, and just bad energy and war and elections and blah, 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 blah. Oh God. I, I absorbed. Yeah. I mean, I literally shut it down. And that's when we started writing that song. So it was, it, it covered all the landscape of, of, of the marriage ending and of what was happening in the world. So, so thank you so much for understanding that song. Yeah. You know, it, it just, um, because it, it's kind of when, you know, there's civil war, which really isn't civil at all. And right. then there's when you cross that line, you have that line of not, this is, you know, you can fight all you want, but then you're going to cross that line. And right. then it's wild country, you know, right. sorry, but that's actually funny how you had that next, right? It is. That's I didn't right. mean to say that it just happened, but it, right. well, it is. Then, then Good. it's like the gloves are off and now insanity will ensue. And right. then it's like, okay, how are you going to put, you know, the toothpaste back in? And right. so it, it's, and and people do go there. It's when we kind of get into that animalistic side of ours. And animalistic can be good. It can be fun. Um, but then it can it can also be very painful. And we've done that in our country. We do it with our relationships. And that centering is important. And that's what music to me is all about. Nature and music, those two things really can get, you know, you could be having a, re- you could have, wake up and have all the intentions of a good day. Something crappy happens. And then you're like, wah. Put some music on. It changes everything. It changes absolutely everything, I believe. And so that's what I, you know, the pandemic was rough. Of course, all these other things that happened too. But um, I think the the good thing is musicians, you know, got to record because they weren't touring. And like you, you know, you, you put out these amazing albums. And while the world doesn't feel like it's getting that much better, we've at least got new music to, to um, keep us going and moving forward. So thank you for a, an amazing album. Hopefully we'll get to see you live. I do encourage people uh, to watch uh, the videos too. Um, I'll put that in the show links, everyone. I'll put Lance's website, uh, LanceLopez.net. Of course, the album is coming out or well, is out now on Cleo Records, Cleopatra Records. Um, the vinyl, that's limited edition, right? And did you get to choose orange for, for the vinyl or, or was that like a, the the up the upper yeah, we, we management wanted <laughs> we wanted something cool something special you know and 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 being that that vinyl has the resurgence of vinyl which is what i grew up with on all the mm-hmm. great records that changed my life what all began with the dropping of a stylus on vinyl that that sound that was almost as important as what followed that sound was that needle dropping and we my brother and i had a large uh stereo as a kid we had two big 15 inch speakers. And so that was a big impactful thing. So it was very important that, you know, that the resurgence of vinyl and, and, and I wanted something special when you opened it and you pulled it out. It wasn't just your typical vinyl. I, you know, it, it wanted to add to the added excitement. And I felt like that was a, a very exciting thing to have a, a piece of orange vinyl and to have that, that moment for that experience. I wanted young musicians or anybody that, 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 that listens to this album to hear that needle drop and then the sounds that follow. That's awesome. That's awesome. I'm so glad. And, and whether people like Jack White or not, everybody has a love thing, not love him. Um, he really helped get vinyl back into. Absolutely. Um, well, we love Jack really, White over here and, and he's our buddy. And, and, yeah. You know, we, so absolutely. And then again, uh, you're right. Another forebearer of bringing vinyl back to the forefront. Jack absolutely was single-handedly uh, instrumental in that happening. Yeah, I'm hoping, like Cherry, uh, Cherry Records, I think, is doing it. Cleopatra, obviously, um, which mm-hmm. I love. I love these these labels, you know, that, right. um, yeah, it, they don't they don't rape, pillage, and plunder the musician, right. which is fantastic. So, um, everyone, absolutely. CleoRex.com, you can shop there. 
Um, also, like I was saying, LanceLopez.net. And we've got to give a shout out to, again to our friends, Mr. and Mrs. Wild from mm-hmm. the Lion and the Rose Bed and Breakfast in the His- Montford Historic District of Asheville, North Carolina. Check them out at lion-rose.com. But all the links are in the show notes, whether, whether you're listening on YouTube, Spotify, Apple, Google, all of it's there. Thank you so much, Lance. It's been a pleasure having you on the show. Hopefully we'll see you on tour. Thank you so much for having me, Lisa. And 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 just and I conti- wish to continue great energy, good vibes. And thank you so much for having me. And thank you so much for all the lovely things you said about the album. I'm so glad you liked it. Well, I'm sending you my speeding ticket when I get it. Because you know it's going to happen. <laughs> well, I'll send you mine. How about that? All <laughs> right. <laughs> see you in court. <laughs> all right. Exactly. Exactly.